Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. I've started streaming as well. Thanks. Geeta, please start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, welcome. And whoops, am I? Video is off. For some reason, it's not allowing me to. Oh, boy. Sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, yeah. Hello. Uh, sorry for this small delay. Uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, I'm R. Geeta. Uh, one of many scientists responding to COVID-19. I retired last year from the University of Delhi Department of Botany, but continue to be engaged in various things. And nowadays, it seems to be a lot of COVID. My interests are in evolutionary biology, especially evolutionary history. Um, so ISRC, which is the hosting institution here, uh, is a voluntary group of concerned scientists, citizens from different parts of the country and overseas. Uh, currently, we have about 700 members. In addition to scientists who are researchers, faculty, and students, the group also contains illustrators and science communicators, as well as journalists. Uh, this group came together in March uh, who, with an aim of fulfilling what we see as a, our social and democratic responsibilities in this present situation. In terms of analyzing and discussing the situation amongst ourselves and also reaching out to the public with the latest scientific evidence and diverse aspects of the disease it spread, causes and spread. And this uh, event is one of these public outreach uh, events. So uh, before we start, I would like to walk you through the, some of what we do. Uh, some of the main activities that we have are in uh, uh, host hoax busting. And we have our website where you can see this. And I'm just trying to actually share my sc screen so that uh, you can see this. Uh, what's happened? Okay. Sorry, it seems to be showing uh, John's site. Sorry. Okay, so can you see this? Yes, some of the things that we do are uh, for the public. So one of the main activities is busting hoaxes. So we have popularization resources, questions and answers on COVID and public statements. Now, under the popularization resources, we have various uh, aspects like daily life and COVID-19. So under which especially I'd like to draw your attention now to the mental health and living in isolation, you know, different kinds of issues that come up. We are going to have some release something uh, soon on um, students and mental health. And something that we also have been doing is modeling and people have the modeling group has been sharing its, uh, you know, results on a daily basis on, on the trends, the not very uh, comforting trends that we are seeing across the country. Uh, we also have um, this uh, sh resources that are available for people for as post lockdown um, efforts. So that the idea is to reinforce the point that even after lockdown, uh, you need to be uh, practicing all uh, these precautionary measures and we as you can see we have it in different languages uh, one more thing we are doing this week is to release a 
something for students, you know, students and teachers under lockdown, sometimes at a loss, sometimes bored, sometimes wanting to uh, show up on things. And so here we have various resources that will soon be available. Well, some of them are soon are available and they will soon be available. They're directed at high school and uh, undergraduate uh, students and teachers. And we hope that uh, everybody can actually um, benefit from that. So, um, Please do contact us if you are interested in partaking any of, uh, of these activities. And especially, I hope that there'll be people here who are not normally conversing with scientists. And therefore, if you can you know, give us your inputs and your perspectives, it would be wonderful. Um, now I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, John Matthew is an associate professor at CREA University. He's in the division of uh, science, which includes uh, biological sciences and humanities and social sciences. So he straddles both worlds. He's formerly taught at Harvard University, University of Massachusetts at uh, Boston, Duke University and ICER, Pune. He holds bachelor's, master's and MPhil degrees in zoology from MCC. Uh, got a doctorate in ecological sciences from the US in Old Dominion University, master's and PhD from Harvard in the medical anthropology and then history of science. He has fo focused on making zoological natural history in India uh, um, understanding or the making of it in under the French and the British. And this work got him interested in zoonotic and microbial uh, diseases and especially those that cause pandemics. So he has been investigating the great uh, Spanish flu or great influenza of 1918-19 and uh, in the Bombay presidency. I am painfully aware of the frequent and skeptical response to the idea that historical perspective on biological problems can be valuable to practical practicing bi biologists, especially as somebody who studies evolutionary history, I'm particularly aware of it. But I also have happily witnessed the aha moments that people experience when they see how that might actually be the case. And I, we look forward to today's webinar and coming across some aha moments. John. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Can all of you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Geetha, Jam, Rufika, and everyone who's come over here. I'm very grateful. What I'm going to do is try and share my screen. And there okay. Can you see this? Yeah. Well, it started. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me go to this. Oh, I mean, that's not in the way. Cool. All right. Why should history matter to scientists? I'm going to try and show you. And um, this is the abstract that I sent you. So why should it matter? And what I'm going to do is look at two particular pandemics and, um, and investigate in some sense how one had a major impact upon the other and how that other in some sense casts its long shadow over the course of a century on what we're experiencing right now. And uh, I'm not going to read this out. You can, but here we are, we've got, the important thing over here is that anywhere between 12 and 20 million Indian lives were lost. But what I'm gonna do is to start with something that actually historians abhor. And that is, the notion of conflation and of the counterfactual. And the way I'm doing this is by superimposing something. Over here, you've got on the right, uh, Sikh soldiers in the First World War, and on the left, a lorry full of guest workers being taken back from Andhra Pradesh to Tamil Nadu, something that we witnessed because when we were trying to help. And, the, and what I would like you in many ways to reflect upon through this talk is what you may see during the course of it that resonates with what you're reading right now. And the question I would actually leave over here right away, we're gonna ask right away over here, is um, what if we were talking about 
soldiers coming back after a war to what they imagined would be heroes' welcomes. And compare that to what you're seeing on the left over here as we reflect upon the notion of dignity. Uh, excuse me, John. Could you put it on your on the screen, you know, the show mode rather than the because you know, the only thing is I need this is not coming on presentation, so okay. I can't okay. 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 But you've got okay. And when we think about and so here's India Gate. And uh, this, of course, you know, is for people who fought and died in the First World War and all the way into the Third Afghan War. Now, I'd like you to look at this, at this figure. And I'd say, I mean, at this, at this, at this uh, excerpt from Pale Rider by Laura Spinney. And let's look at this. Between the first recorded case, between the 4th of March, 1918, and the last in March, 1920, it killed 50 to 100 million people, or between 2.5 to 5% of the global population. In terms of single events causing a major loss of life, it surpassed the First World War, Second World War, and possibly both put together. It was the greatest tidal wave of death since the Black Death, it was from 1347 to 1352, perhaps in the whole of human history. Um, I think there's a problem. And that although she did. Uh, John, I, we can't hear you. What's the problem? Uh, can, yeah. When did you stop hearing? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horse pale rider. She herself uh, fell victim to the Spanish flu, not fatally. She did recover. But the important thing is, this was all in the context of the First World War. And the reflection over here is if we think we have it bad now, imagine what it means if we fall up in global cataclysm that involved belligerent nations, such as a global conflict. And that is why the Spanish flu stands out in this particular regard. This is what they were seeing. People were dying of this, troops. I mean, France may have lost six times as many people to war as um, to the Spanish flu, Germany four times, Britain three times, Italy twice, but every other place was losing far more people to this. And heliotropsinosis, the face would turn entirely blue, heading towards black. And at one point, people couldn't even tell, ironically, what race the person was, because that was the nature of the disease. The Spanish influenza, influenza itself coming from the word influence, uh, the, the Italian form of it suggesting the stars had something to do with it. Spanish, why? Because Spain, being neutral in the First World War, declared its debts to this, to what it called the soldier from Naples, because that kind of, of, of that name was playing there at that point in time. But the moniker of the Spanish influenza took on largely, or the Spanish flu, largely because belligerent nations did not declare mortalities to the flu for fear that it might affect morale of troops. So if ever there is a historical injustice, it is in this particular name. The global trajectories of the Spanish flu were as follows. Black shows the first wave, which was from March to August, and was actually rather similar to a seasonal flu. People died, but it wasn't excessive. It was the second wave, so about 13 weeks of it, between August and December, uh, yeah, maybe September through November, uh, into December, which was the mother of all pandemics, and really, and really, debilitated entire countries. And the third wave, which was in Australia, Jan, I mean, Jan to July, but it was much more minor. So there's a sense of the first, of the worldwide diffusion of influenza in 1918. And then in the second wave, you can see where it is going. And here's a summary of, and I just, and all I'd like you to do here is look on the left and see the number of countries hit and where they are. They're as far flung as India and Brazil, right? You've got, 
and Switzerland and China, and it's it's really quite it's quite telling. That in his report from the census of India, 1921, Harvester, although famine relief is perfected, Indian scarcity was not necessarily accompanied by high mortality, but India was not to escape, and the influenza epidemic starting in the latter part of 1918 visited almost every portion of the country and wiped out in a few months practically the whole natural increase in the population for the previous seven years. John Barry, the great influenza, says throughout the Indian subcontinent there was only death. Chains left with the living and around dead and dying. While Caucasians suffered a case mortality of 9.6%, Indian troops, 21.69, reported died. One hospital in Delhi treated 13,190 influenza patients, 7,044 of those patients died. And if we think about what's happening in Delhi right now, resonances are uncomfortably close. Comparative figures for India. Different people have different ideas based upon uh, uh, various ways of data, but here we are. You've got 10 to 20 in some cases, but for the most people, they 13.88. Um, but yes, I mean, it's normally put about between 12 to 18, and there we are. And it's in, in an India that looked like this at that particular point in time. Um, one thing that we do need to remember when we talk about 2.5 to 5 percent population is that we're looking at a world population that was five billion fewer than right now and that's why these numbers are particularly stark i have been doing work in the maharashtra state archives in bombay and the, and i and i throw up over here a couple of photographs of the original documents and here's and i've and typing them out here you are uh, in Pune, where I used to live, the influenza uh, epidemic is of a very severe order. The death rate has reached the high figure of over 200 per diem. And at the same time, in Sholapur, you had um, uh, Collector Simcox, of course, in, in very proper description saying, I have the honor to report that Sholapur is suffering from an epidemic of very high proportions, a death rate normally 10 per day, has risen to 180. And again, I would, I would like us to reflect upon the spikes in numbers that we are seeing in cities at this point in time to see levels of comparison a century across. David Arnold, uh, an eminent historian of medicine of India, who wrote a wonderful book called uh, Colonizing the Body, um, has done something very interesting. He's compared two epidemics, and these are diseases that, at which I look. And, and an interesting question over here is, why don't we make more of the great influenza, now called a Spanish flu, as we do? I mean, I mean, why do we make of it than we do? I wonder how many of us sitting over here read about uh, the 1918 flu in our history books. I know I didn't. And uh, it's ironic that the flu might now make an entry into the history book because of this moment of right now by way of comparison. But here's David Arnold saying this. He says, right, uh, this is, so he said, sorry, 12.5, maybe 18 to 20 million. And yet where plague provoked full-scale panic, um, there seems to be no particular comparable situation as far as influenza are concerned. So in Silver Blades, you have Sherlock Holmes being asked by Inspector, what, what do you see in the dog didn't bark? And, and this is the case of the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, if you heard it. And he said, and he said, the dog did nothing. And he says, that is a curious incident. And uh, part of this, particular monument, the Chafe Memorial, are uh, widely regarded as nationalistic heroes. The claim is that on the 22nd of June, 1897, they got the commission. The play commissioner 
Um, John, That's I think we are getting... Uh, excessively so. And the sense was that he was... Can you hear me? Um, it's kind of getting interrupted frequently, often. How does this sound? Okay, just speak. How does this seem? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, because I was using my. Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, so this Chaffee Memorial, as I said, when this was lovely, people like the plague commissioner, and in a, in a description by two doctors who go under the collective name Kalpish. The quarantine papers, they actually, if you look at the bottom left, point to this fact where the Chapeka brothers murder Walter Rand, one of the first major political assassinations in the country. The quarantine papers involves a same archives that I visit in Bombay. And uh, what, the, what these two doctors have done is essentially take verbatim the memoranda on the plague and the nature of the quarantining that existed in Bombay at that time. One of the major players was this man, Valdemar Hafkin. And Hafkin uh, was the Ukraine actor who worked at and then helped with cholera in, um, in Calcutta, and then was called to work on the plague in Bombay. Uh, uh, again, Kalpishratna, Kalpana Swaminath, and Ishrit Syed, the two of them, uh, write about this, about the Bombay Plague, in their book, Room 000, um, in this gubernatorial place, uh, connected with Grant Medical College in Bombay, uh, which, and now which has gone into becoming the Hafkin Institute for Trading, Research, and Testing. But the story over here was already extra local, and it had started uh, over here in Hong Kong in 1894. And another situation that's happening right now is the race to find a vaccine. And these were the two gentlemen at play, Kitasato Shibasaburo and Alexandre Yersin, uh, one Japanese, the other uh, Swiss, uh, the first supported by Robert Koch, the second by the Pasteur Group. And uh, the Germans then in with the British, uh, got a lot of support for Kitasato, while Yersin had to stay out in this particular match. But for all of that, he was the one who eventually uh, was able to find what he would call Pastorella pestis, now called Yersinia pestis for the plague. And over here you find his original microscope, and this is from uh, in his house museum in, uh, in uh, Vietnam, in Nha Trang. Now, Armed with this, uh, Yersin was invited to come to India however, and with his particular vaccine. However, it was contaminated, didn't work, and Yersin had to leave in some disgrace. So here's a timeline of events over there. Hafkin count, 1893, outbreak, 1894, Hafkin enlisted for help, 1896, Yersin comes in 1897. But here's another thing on which I would like us to reflect. Emergency meeting in Venice threatens an embargo of goods from India, 1897. So you have the passing of the Epidemic Diseases Act in 1897. Now this immediately has two moments of resonance which we have. One, what will the effect be on the economy of British India? Something that's very much uh, in our thinking at this point in time. And the second, what did it mean to have such a draconian act which has been deployed even now and uh, stays in the statute books. And, and so that's something for us to consider. Now, the features of this act were the authorized people to confiscate or disrupt property, permitted hospitalization, allowed rapid disposal, and travelers instead of inspection of travelers by road rail, uh, road rail and sea. And if you think about e passes right now, again, resonances. Now, the sources of panic were the British government in India, the Indian elite, the middle classes, and the poor. But we see this point of the curious incident of dog in my time. Why the dog not bark? Now, the far less intervention state experiences because the plague was, I mean, it was, it was terrible. And the British suddenly realized that if they were going to be quite so, as I said, zealous and intrusive, um, they were going to pay in some sense. But another thing which had happened was that the plague lasted, and so there was great apathy. On the other hand, the uh, more forward-looking British 
administrators started to work with community leaders across costs, and that began to help tremendously. Uh, the social service group in, in India in 1911 helped tremendously in this particular regard in Bombay. The other thing that the, the Spanish flu really suffered for was poor timing. The First World War had just happened, and there was already a great sense of, of loss in many ways and of hopelessness. The other thing is that it was extremely rapid. 13 weeks, it came and go, uh, it came and went broad, but uh, shallow in some sense. It hit a lot of people and then went out. It also, in, in this particular time, also was the infamous moment of Jardinwala Bagh. And so a lot of attention turned immediately towards that particular moment. And again, I'd reflect, I'd ask us to reflect on moments that are happening in terms of social inequity at this point in time, and whether there is a change in focus, even as we have the overlay of COVID upon us. And the last thing was arrival from the West rather than the East. In the West, you, the idea was that progress came and then suckling gratitude, the East would return disease. However, in this particular case, that didn't seem to be the case. And so that rather uh, queered the pitch. One very interesting situation uh, and this, uh, uh, regards a story with the port health officer and that was Major Houston, an action regarding him because of a notion of, because of an issue of quarantine. Now these are essentially, this is, what happened over here was that a, a committee was set up to investigate why Major Houston had not acted when a ship carrying people who had uh, hospital D as we call it, having influenza were allowed, why, why they were allowed to disembark. Now, from the get go, you had people who said, look, this is a bit much. And Mr. Jane Boulay, uh, a medical administrator said, I'm opposed to, it, to widening the scope of the, of the inquiry. Epidemics are an evil. No country succeeded in avoiding it. And the debate leaves me cold. It might be interesting, but we are shorthanded and our officers so hard worked that I think in times of war, we must let this problem pass. Now a man called Mr. Uh, Dr. Dada Chanji, who was uh, part of the uh, Bombay Municipal uh, Committee was a person, a uh, corporation was the person who said that this was the major issue and uh, Major Houston had been negligent. And he said culpable neglect on his part. The findings of the committee were that, except that he might have exercised more discretion, he was not to blame. And the reason was that influenza was not under quarantine. And if you look at this from even earlier, the Indian Ports Act said, the proposal to declare it influenza as one of the dangerous infectious diseases is negatived, to use that word. And um, so Houston was working under that particular dispensation, right? And so this is what you have over here. The, these are the diseases, smallpox, chickenpox, measles, plague, cholera, plague, cholera, but not the flu. And this is what they say. The word influenza was asked for and they said they are alive, alive to the risk that this could be a problem. The executive health officer says it's declining, but we know that it's appearing in a virulent form. The date is the 25th of October, 1918. And the problem here is the Surgeon General says no. And the government goes with the Surgeon General ultimately uh, bringing much of Bombay to grief because of that decision. But there was another issue, and that was people didn't even know what a virus, the way we understand it today, was. The word that was used was a filtrable virus, the kind, uh, the, uh, the cause of a contagion that could, prop, that, could, that could slip through material that should be able to catch bacteria because they were so much smaller. As you can see, the discussion was the bacteriology of influenza. Uh, and a man called Richard Pfeiffer had actually thought that it was a bacterium that was causing the disease because it was found in this. However, what was increasingly clear was that this did not meet Koch's postulates about the fact that it should be found in every diseased individual, and it was not. Now, Laura Spinney, 
She says there are very few cemeteries in the world that, assuming they're older than a century, don't contain a cluster of graves from the autumn of 1918, when the second and worst wave of the pandemic struck, and people's memories reflect that. But there's no cenotaph in London, Moscow, or Washington. The Spanish flu is remembered personally, not collectively, not as a historical disaster, but as millions of discrete, private tragedies. Now, when I was in Pune, some of us had a, a choral remembrance on Armistice Day in the Turkey War Cemetery, where a number of people that died in the First World War and also the Second are commemorated um, on the centenary occasion. Now, this is one of the things that where memorialization does exist. If you were to go to Belgium, you would see this, the brooding soldier. There are a number of war memorials because uh, there is, of course, the great grief associated with that level of death. At, this was at the Second Battle of Ypres and the brooding soldier, the Canadian soldiers who died there because of the gas that was used at the time, the first time it was ever used in that mass way. At the hands of uh, the man on the right, Fritz Haber, who of course, you know, with Karl Bosch goes on to, I mean, at different points will win the Nobel Prize for the fixation of ammonia. But. And of course, there is the, the very powerful poem by William Owen, which again is its own memorialization of the dead without at all glorifying war. Uh, when you say your friends, you will not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. The other thing, of course, is the nature of diseases that are romantic. There is, of course, TB, and, and it finds its way into opera, and such that because the romantic disease that when uh, AIDS, which uh, HIV AIDS, which becomes the equivalent of uh, TB in the late 20th century, has its own, uh, its own reflections in the arts through plays like Angels in America and the musical Rent. But so far, as far as I know, at least, there's been no, no pin to influenza, despite, its, despite the fact that it's been the most massive killer in a really short period of time. I'd like us to think about our moment now and to cast our minds back to the various months through which we have gone. At the beginning, there was hope, the kind of hope where they said people stayed home and suddenly the pollution was getting, was, uh, was diminishing in Delhi. And you could see spurs of the Himalayas again from Jalandhar and, uh, and there was this. Then the virus stayed and this started to happen. And then this started to happen. And I'd like us in some senses to see how we make sense and look at approaches from within the scientific community. My point over here is that science is an essentially social activity as much as any other. The March for Science in 2017 had as one of its demands a return to scientific temper. And it was interesting that you had people coming out, coming out. I was part of this when I was in Pune, for what is functionally an abstraction, if an important one. Right now, the disease is no abstraction. And um, I think we're losing you again, John. Can you hear me now? Can you uh, hear me? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? I said, so even as we even as we have scientists somewhat cherry, what I would raise over here is that this particular moment of scientists responding to COVID is itself a historic event. The people involved are writing themselves into history. In 1914, when the First World War began, 
the Indian Science Congresses came into being. There have been lamentable moments in the recent past, but in general, there has been so much that has been gleaned from them. One of the questions I was asking the organizers here is how often have Indian scientists come together for a particular cause or reason? And that's something on which I would like us to reflect at some point in time. Ultimately, there is this, these very powerful lines by Susan Sontag. Illness is the more onerous citizenship. Everyone who's born is due citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. Now, I'd like to play something if I can find it and tell me if you can hear this. Let me see. Sorry, this is um, it's been playing two minutes. I'll tell you exactly what it says, and that is there is a short uh, series on coronavirus and narrated by Jake Simmons at the end of the pandemic. Of this, of this first episode, there is a note of triumphalism. The point that if the virus had agency, it would know not mess. Um, sorry, we lost that. Can you repeat that? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Mm -hmm. On the coronavirus called pandemic, and it ends with these lines. I mean, with J.K. Simmons uh, reading out the lines, saying that if the virus agency functionally would know. Nope, we lost you again. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. But you know, it's got this kind uh, of. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I said. So it, so don't mess with us. Essentially, is what they say. Yeah. There we are. Hopefully, let's hopefully this will play. But if viruses were capable of thinking, they should have also learned their lesson. One second. Let me see if I can. Can you see that? Uh, actually, can you see that? Your screen sharing has stopped. We okay, can let see. Me try and, yeah. One second. Let me just get back to this for a second. What is this? Um, can you see this? Can you see this? Yeah. If their goal is to replicate, they shouldn't start killing us. Because once a virus becomes a pandemic, all of human ingenuity will be brought to bear to bring them down. We should have been more prepared. But when it comes to technology, science, and coordination, we've also never been more prepared. This new virus was identified within days. The sequence was shared a few days later, and because of that, testing began really across the globe. Scientists around the world are committing entire labs to creating a vaccine, the, the fastest uh, vaccine ever created um, in, in history. The world's fastest supercomputer has run thousands of simulations and identified 77 drug compounds that might effectively stop the virus. It's amazing the way the scientific community has gathered together. We know what it takes because we've been in this race since life on Earth began. And a virus hasn't beaten us yet. Mm -hmm. All right. So did you, I don't know. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, so, and, so that's the first of them. The second one is about the vaccine and the race for it and all of the craven competition that goes about who 
about who's going to get there first. And suddenly all those moments, the battle angels of our nature seem to have vanished. And the third one is the most reflective. And it's about how to cope, which is such a different note that's being struck from the words that we just heard. So I'm going to close with this and say this. I'm going to say the history of science speaks the interconnectedness of humanity. Science is not hermetically sealed. It is inevitably constructed. And that construction falls to the societies whose values and morals shape it and from which its practitioners or scientists are drawn. That also means, however, that such constructions can be plural in scope. And ultimately in that fact, like both our excesses and our redemption. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. That was uh, very interesting and um, edifying. Um, so let me just, um, there have been some questions that have been written in. I'm not sure whether we have any from uh, that come in later, but several of them, uh, I've sort of grouped them into one was basically historical questions about um, um, geography and lessons from that. Um, so one question is which countries successfully handled the Spanish influenza and what can we learn from that in the context of uncertainty? Oh, have we lost you? Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, so. Okay, so which ones? Australia actually, interestingly, dealt with it rather well. They kept, they kept ships out and they, and they kept their ports largely closed at this particular point in time. So they missed the second wave, but then they thought it had passed. And so if anything, Australia got the third wave. But Australia was a country that really missed the major part of it. And that's because they took the kind of steps that in many ways, New Zealand has taken now. And uh, Australia has to some extent as well. So again, that's, a, that's another situation where the parallels are really quite eerie. So yeah, keep going. Okay. Yeah. Um, so can we say that the current scientific and technological supremacy of today reduced the margin for error as compared to times when there was no pencil in, for instance? Has it changed over the years? What's been interesting, I think, is that um, the major okay, the major shift has been that has been in the nature of pandemic disease. It's not like the others don't exist, but it's about the fact that most diseases right now of a pandemic nature are viral. Mm. Uh, what we did have before were a number of bacterial diseases. And so major steps have been taken in that particular regard. And I think that's certainly a po point of triumph, if you will, if you want to use that word of certainly progress as far as some levels of disease are concerned. But if you look at what we've been dealing with in the last 30 years, we've had HIV AIDS, we've had SARS, we've had swine flu, we've had Nipah, we've had Zika, uh, and now we have this. I mean, if anything, the fear is that there will be more, right? And uh, yes, I mean, uh, again, let's just go back to that, to that first statement, uh, I mean, to that statement that was made in the first episode of the pandemic. And, if anything, it's cautionary just not to say things like that. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, one question is why is there have been so many pandemics, as you mentioned, uh, even in recent years, why is COVID-19 considered to, to be so deadly? And where, why is there a panic alarming among, among the public and government? Um, what were the strategies used during other outbreaks uh, is there a strategy that could be adapted, adopted or adapted from our history of pandemic situations? Okay, so this is an interesting one because I've said that this falls directly between history and prediction. And um, one of the points where the predictions coming in is the whole notion 
you know, of saying that there will be waves. And you couldn't have had that unless you had understandings of other, of other pandemics. Um, the problem with COVID-19 is unlike SARS, where the symptoms were, became manifest very quickly, people can be asymptomatic. And so that's really the sneaky part of this particular virus. And uh, it's a really hard one because if people are asymptomatic, then unless there's going to be an incredible amount of, of testing, it's, it's going to be a problem. The other issue is that it doesn't have really ramped up mortality rates, unlike MERS, for example, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that's the whole thing, right? I mean, in order to be effective, you should not kill too many. You, the, so that you can have your super spreaders, so that it can be going, well, uh, I was about to say viral, but that would be, we you know what that means. Yes, but, uh, to be able to go well into the population uh, through that level of networking, if you will. And so that's the issue. It's the fact that it isn't the most infectious that makes it particularly problematic. But, that, but that, that's what leaves us again in this place of uncertainty. What do we do in some sense? And is it, I mean, all of these have been tried. Will herd immunity essentially result in natural selection? Will it, is it the people that already have underlying health issues going to be the more susceptible? But as a consequence, will the, will the population that gets immunity be remarkably uh, healthy? And that's, and that's, and that, that's a whole herd immunity angle. The, if you do have if you do have lockdowns, is it to wait for the vaccine until it comes? But how long will that take? In the meantime, you've got economies with which to contend. And especially, I mean, countries in the South, which cannot afford to lose the kind of time that we have. And we're seeing what we are. Right now, one of the questions that we've been asking is, when a guest worker dies, is that a COVID-related death? And it's and and that's something which we absolutely need to consider. So, yeah. cool. uh, so the nineteen next question is nineteen eighteen influenza pandemic also played similarly in India, where metros were primarily affected and eventually spread to the rural areas where you know mass migrations along the train routes of British India. Correct. Have we learned or missed learning from this hundred year old lesson? If so, what can we do now going forward? I think what's similar is that there is mass migration from the cities. And um, well, Bombay started losing a lot of its population of the plague. And so people like Tata started to build the Taj as, as a statement of faith in that particular city. But if, there's a, if the lesson that's been learned has been for the police to stop movement in such draconian ma manner, then I think we're facing a moral twilight in some sense, because you think that you can't move people, so they're just kept put there. But where do you put them? Their own states don't want them in this particular regard. So I don't, so even if you say, fine, we can see this, we can see this through theoretically. I'm not sure how practically it's played out. If you know what I mean. If, are you with me? Uh, yeah, no, I just want to clarify. So are you saying that this kind of force was used on the people when they migrated uh, at the time? Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can attest to this. Okay. And uh, people were, and then, uh, Something's happening to your sound, voice. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so I said no. The um, I mean, we were helping here. I mean, in on, on the other on the other border, and the police uh, were putting people in lorries and stacking them like cattle, essentially. Oh. And we the ones who that that was my picture, the one that I showed you of the migrant workers. They were being sent back to 
across yeah, the border to Madras. No, I wasn't and, questioning that. I was questioning the previous time, uh, 1918. Or 1918. No, in 1918, there wasn't simply because people were fleeing and ma- many of them were returning. Well, many, uh, that com- compounded by the fact that returning troops were just going home, right? So there wasn't that sense. And that's the whole point about the Spanish flu. Because they had, they had learned lessons from the plague, they didn't want to get that involved for fear that there would be reprisals and repercussions. The irony, of course, is the Royal Act came into being. And so another set of repercussions occurred, but those were political. They were not on the base of quarantine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just, since we seem to be running out of time, I just wanted to move on to the next group of questions. Sorry for those who asked other uh, specific questions. Uh, COVID related ones. So these are about how can knowing about history help scientists? And I'll just sort of read them out to you and maybe you can just, uh, can history help the scientists for prediction of the future if then how? Career avenues for science students? Uh, Where do science and history intermingle? Do you have any suggested history readings for scientists? Should these aspects be introduced during uh, school education? Um, I think we'll just leave it at that if you can. Uh, with, um, can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. The, as I said earlier, that it's purely on the basis of history that you're making predictions, as I said, even about facts like waves and are we going to see them? Um, here's one example, right? Hydroxychloroquine was tried, right? Um, it's interesting that quinine was tried in the Spanish flu. Now, there was no particular reason for it to be, uh, to be deployed, but it was because people were essentially using scattershot and trying to find anything that would work. And, and it's interesting that that has been followed again in this particular regard. I mean, I cannot begin to... Uh, to stop talking about just how many resonances there are between then and now. So is there anything to learn? I think, I mean, my immediate answer is yes, with the cautionary note that you need to look at context, right? I mean, I still, I mean, uh, John V. Palke earlier said historians don't predict and, uh, and I would be loath to, but I wonder whether we will find see anything of the of the relative rates of loss with COVID nineteen as we did with the Spanish flu, and um, it's really important for us to remember that in absolute numbers we may see a lot, but the fact is, as a proportion of the population, I do not suspect that that is going to happen. But I do think that that but those kind of comparisons are worth making, and then. And, 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 then, and then we can see what can be learned. There are obvious things that are gonna happen, sociological as much as historical. Is it the density of population makes a difference? What does it mean when we're talking about Dharavi as a slum and what, are the, and, and what might happen over there? Um, is, it that partic- is it that particular communities are, uh, are affected the most, people that are in more impecunious circumstances? And in the United States, for example, sadly, that maps onto race in a particular way. That's just one example. Uh, In terms of of science study, reading absolutely in two areas. One, the history of science, and I've tried to map this out with this particular case. And the other is in the arena of science, technology, and society studies, which is, in some sense, the... uh, a critique of the scientific method itself, I mean, of, 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 of what scientists do, but also a sense of how they can be reflection by scientists of the work that they do. One of the key issues over here is determining who stakeholders are. Is it that scientists become the voices from on high telling you what to do? Or is it that science, scientists are but one set of those stakeholders and, uh, and uh, working in, in these particular regards with, for example, local communities and the like. Um, if, if people would like to write to me directly, I'm, I mean, there's Mario Biagioli's 
for example, a social studies reader, which is, which is excellent, but uh, certainly if they've got more directed kind of readings, I'm happy to write to them, so. That's great, yes. Um, um, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was just gonna say that to Susan too, but I see that Deepak has said it, and that is, and yes, confessedly, I've been using the word from the Kerala context uh, of guest worker, and yes, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so, um, so there are a few more questions here on the live. There are other questions, many questions actually. I think we need another session. Um, um, one is how, oops, you've employed the guest term, guest worker. No, I'm sorry, I don't know. Sorry, I just had the, okay. How and when can the community, scientific community intervene to help states value the dignity of life under conditions such as this? And uh, what, what was the reason for the second wave in the Spanish flu? Um, okay, fine. Um, okay, so once I start, um, one, I'm, it's an interesting question and that's, and again, it goes back, I think to the history of mobilization. And that's a question that I had and I've asked you this Geetha as well. And it's about how scientists can actually become a force for political act, um, activism in, and I mean that in a small p sense, not in terms of actual governance. But, and you mentioned to me that when say the, uh, the tests happened in 1998. There was a time when, when, when scientists came together, and uh, and I see and I sincerely believe that it is imperative that scientists work with people on the ground to be just as resolute ambassadors as anything else. Because I mean, as for their own work. And this again is a very STS position to take on the subject, but I would, but I, but it's something that I would endorse to the full. It does mean that people need to see that, that I think that modeling, for example, very often does happen behind closed doors. And I think the lived experience is so tremendously important in this particular regard. As far as the second wave goes, it was largely because the US got into the war. The idea is that, I mean, patient zero is, is largely, is widely believed to have come from Kansas. And uh, then there was a move for troops to Boston. And then they moved to the trenches in France and Belgium, right? And so there was this move. So there were three major places where it broke out with Boston. And then you had a breakout the British uh, ships were also taking people over. There were outbreaks over there. They went, uh, so there, were, there, was a, there, were, there was a breakout in Senegal. There was a breakout in Brest, in France, and there was in Boston. And, and then, and let's think. Uh, losing you, we're losing you, John. Lost you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. I said, uh, um, I, so I, I said, uh, think about the fact that people are essentially packed cheek by jowl in trenches. And so this is where it completely decimates troops. And while I was pointing out that Germany, France, England, and Italy lost more people in war than to the flu, the fact that you actually had a two is to one or three is one at this point, you haven't had the one in this regard, is because towards the end, uh, they were being wiped out because of the flu. People like Ludendorff were talking about the fact that his men were in no condition to fight anymore. And that may have well pushed the end of the war in this particular regard. And then people are going home and what's happening? They're going to port cities and these are troops. And so again, I would ask us to, re to think about that first slide when I actually put um, migrant workers and say no. how do we do it. Yeah, yeah we, we can't hear you now. Yeah. Um, Can actually, you hear me now? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So quickly, can you can you sort of uh, explain the term guest worker versus migrant worker? It, 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 I mean, just is there uh, uh, what's the reason behind? I mean, for I, I went with the term. It was being used in Kerala, and I and I personally liked it because it is it a more polite word. Yes, and I chose it because it afforded the worker dignity, and that was the term that I. That I chose. So yes, the answer to Susan is absolutely conscious and in this regard. Presumably, that is the reason it was coined in the first place. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And I think that now the question now one, one can see it another way. And you can say, does that become a euphemism? Very, very probably. And uh, and one and I must admit the times that I use the words interchangeably, but in this particular case, I did want to go with the with the notion of dignity. Yeah. I'm afraid we're going to have to close this up, but thank you so much, uh, John, uh, despite the sound. I know, I'm so sorry, uh, my, it's, yeah, it's yeah. my um, um, So we've had this very yeah. interesting talk from John Matthew on what happened, not just at the time of the 1918 flu, but prior to that in the plague, and specifically the kinds of things that happened in Bombay and how we might or might not learn from those lessons. And I think there's just so much out there that we hope that we'll be able to explore these some of these issues much more, more. But equally, the definite point being made that scientists, he, he talks of how the ISRC has written ourselves into history by coming together like this. And, and I say more power to all of you out there watching. And please do contribute and help us to keep this going as a as a sustained uh, movement because uh, we do really need more people. Um, so please join us uh, next Sunday for a new session and join us through the Google group. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John. And thank you audience for being here. And thank you everyone.